Hello everyone, you are about to listen to the teaching of Pastor Raymond Burnett, pastor of Mana Worship Center. We hope that you will learn from the message you are about to hear and to realize that books will inform, but the Bible has the power to transform you. Now sit back and open your mind and heart for God to speak to you. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have today to talk a little bit about you and your word and your son Jesus and the fantastic thing he did for all of us. It is quite an amazing plan that, Father, you, 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 you three planned before the world was formed, implemented it, fulfilled most of it, and the rest is yet to come. And we were always on your mind, so you allow us to be born into this world and you've given us the responsibility to add other people to the family. And even today, Father, help us to understand how blessed we are, how uniquely special we are, and help us to also understand that you love us just the way we are. Now, Father, I yield myself to you, and I give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. John 12. Jesus was about to die. The week, that, the Sunday that led up to the Good Friday. Is where we're going to read here. John chapter 12. Verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Came there to talk to Mary. I was working on that part of the scripture a little bit. And I thought that this is probably what we're going to be talking about. It was about the woman with the alabaster box of ointment. And I thought... I was getting all prepared. My head was working it in. I'm thinking, this is fantastic. Can you imagine what it feels like to be a woman in that context of his world? Because then, if you were to study the tabernacle, the women had their own courts. It was, they were never sitting together with their husbands. No, nope, that never happened. They went to synagogue, but they went to separate rooms. Quite Things changed greatly. Jesus in his house wanted to, just came for dinner. And this woman named Mary showed up. But she had been saving for one year. I wondered, this is not the sermon for today, but I'm telling you, I'm leading up to something. I wondered how long she was, it is believed that this was the Mary who had a number of demons in her. I wondered a year before that, what decision she made and what she wanted to do. I thought, I wonder if she knew he was going to die and when. And what the cost would have been for her to buy this alabaster box of ointment. We call it perfume. Equivalent to one year's salary. That's a lot of money then. Can you imagine you buying a gift for somebody, you plan to give someone a gift that's going to be equivalent to you working for a whole year? And you weren't married to the person? <laughs> you get, get the point? Or maybe whatever the context or relationship might be. And I thought, this woman, wow, that's quite a humongous gift. That was going to be our thing today. I, got, I was getting all excited then, just as I'm excited now. And I thought, we were going to eat that up like hot cakes today. And he thought, no, 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 you got to keep on going, Raymond. Just keep on going. That kept on going. So that was the introduction to the week that led up to him being crucified. And then, shortly thereafter, a number of days later, the next day, verse 12, much people come together and they decided that they were going to start waving palm branches. <laughs> palm Sunday, we call it. Jesus was riding on a donkey, said to the disciples, get ready for we get him for that plan there. And I wondered, how did these people know that Jesus was going to be riding on a donkey? Have you wondered that? I've wondered that many times. The disciples must have shared some information to somebody. Jesus did not go around and say, by the way, um, a few days from now, I'm going to be riding, taking a donkey ride into the kingdom, into the streets, and I want you to go get some branches. He didn't advertise. He didn't have any Facebook and all the other stuff that we have now. He didn't send any text messages, nothing like that. But the word went out, and they were coming into the city that time because there was a big celebration happening by the end of that week. So many of them were already in the city. They were already coming 
for Passover. It was a Jewish celebration every year. 14th day, 15th day, 16th day, into that time. And they were waving palm branches. Hosanna, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. But that's not the message for today. And then, verse 20. And there was a certain Greek, and there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. Greeks, Gentiles, Jews, all kinds of people were coming into that area. That weekend was the highlight in that area. Celebrations of things uh, have a way of showing up people and bringing people together. So the, the Greeks, the Gentiles were coming into town. The same came there for to Philip. That means they would have heard about what's going on in the city before they got there. Um, and which was at, of Bethsaida of Galilee and desired him saying, so we would see Jesus. Wait a second. Why did they go to Philip? Well, Philip is a Gentile name. Not like Matthew. Not like Judas. Philip was a Gentile name. So they had been checking out doing their homework. Which of the disciples have that we can go to? So the Greeks went to a man with a Gentile name. Isn't that what we do? We do that. Human beings, we do it, don't we? When you have somebody by the name of that, you say, where are you from? First thing you ask them. And people always assume that you're from where they think you are from. I say, no, I'm not from there. You're not, how come you sound like? You don't, sometimes they don't even know what you really sound like. But they just want to have a conversation with you. They went to Philip. But Philip has also been known prior to this occasion as somebody who le- likes to work with another guy. And look at him. So he decides to see, Philip comes and tell Andrew. These guys were walking buddies. Andrew. And Andrew again, and, Andrew, and again, Andrew and Philip decided they want to tell Jesus. So early in Jesus' ministry, Philip and Andrew had, had this kind of thing happen before. They went to Philip, keep bringing Andrew along. In other words, um, Andrew, you the talker, man, I'm not. Have you ever seen that before? Have you ever gone knocking on doors with somebody before? Yeah, there's some people you knock on the door. In fact, I remember buddy, Pastor Henry James. And him and I used to go knocking on doors. And um, I had met him at Bible College, and he decided to move his family from Ottawa to Toronto when we first started a church many years ago, long before many of you were born. And um, he said to me, you knock the door. And him and Pastor Graves, Ellen Graves, used to work together like teams. They always team up. Him and I do it once in a while. I, I'll handle my own end. But he, he said, all you got to do is get me inside the door. That was his point. You open the door and, and get me in the door and I'm good. And as soon as they get in, he took over the conversation. That's what he was like. He was like this Philip guy. Always wanted to get Andrew. So Andrew would knock on the door and Philip would tell you, hey, this is what it is. It's always good to walk together in pairs. If two or three shall agree as touching anything, it shall be done. If two or three. Then listen to what happened here. And Jesus answered them saying, so they went to Jesus. Jesus answered them, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except us a corn of wheat falls into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, It brings forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hated his life in this world shall keep it unto eternal life. I'm going to read to you a little different translation of that. I decided I'm going to see if I can find another way of saying the same thing. The AMP Bible version says, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, keyword, dies, it remains, in brackets now, just one grain. It never becomes more, but it just lives all by itself. It is alone. It is alone. 
But if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. There's another translation, a CBE. I assure you that unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it can only be a single seed. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I want to like back here. I tell you the truth. Uh, EXB. You know, the all kind of versions we have in our Bible world. Truly, truly, I say unto you, a grain of wheat must fall to the ground and die to make many seeds. But if it never dies, it remains only a single seed. I guarantee is another one. I guarantee this truth. A single grain of wheat doesn't produce anything unless it is planted in the ground and dies. Hmm. Unless. If it dies, it will produce a lot of grain. When I read that, I said, wow, I wonder what's the letter. So I began to do some work and I realized a number of things and I want to give this to you. Um, Jesus was about to come to the end of that week. He's about to die. And he decided he's going to use a little analogy with them and tell them about a grain of wheat. Let's call it a grain of corn. As long as that one grain is hanging out by himself and it never dies, nothing becomes of that grain but only what it is. I want you to, I want you to understand that. Nothing else comes of that. Only what it is. I want you to follow this now. Jesus was trying to get them to understand that something is about to happen to him and he's about to experience death. Something he has never experienced before. He's seen it. He's allowed it. But he's never experienced it. He's God but never experienced what it is to die. Can you imagine? God has never experienced what it is to die, and he's God. Yeah, there are a couple of things that God cannot do. We all know that. God cannot lie. We know that too. The Bible said that. God cannot get sick. Hmm. God cannot get broke. He provides everything. There are a number of things God can't do. So, but God has never experienced what it is to die. But the creatures or the beings that God has made have developed the principle of dying because of sin. So he wanted them back. He wanted all back, everybody back into a relationship with him. And he realized that the wages of sin is death. In other words, the payment, the consequences, the outcome of sin in his dying. So in order for him to experience what we are supposed to experience, he had to experience it by dying. Get it? That's a whole mouthful there. It is the truth. In order for him to free us from the sin thing and from the consequences of it, he himself had to experience what the outcome of it is so he can free us for what is messing us up. He had to die. God could not have reconciled us and not dying. Now, that's the major part of this thing that keeps running around in my head. I'm thinking, this is amazing. You mean to tell me that God surrendered himself to the aspect of dying so he can cancel that for me? Yes. That I don't have to die again. No, no there's a different thing here. I'm not talking about physical death here now. I'm talking about spiritual death. Physical death is actually the byproduct of it too. But really, the worst kind of dying is the spiritual part. Uh, you hear me now? The worst kind of dying is that. Spiritual death is, is it. That's it. You can die physically, but you're still alive spiritually anyway. But if you die physically and you die spiritually, you're really dead. <laughs> you mean, yes, yeah, it's, it's dead. Real dead. D E A D. Dead. It's true. So Jesus said that to them. He said, unless a grain of wheat dies, 
it abides alone. Let me just give you a little bit of a little overview of something that relates to the planting of something or the dying of something, like a seed. When a seed dies, A, it surrenders itself to a process that it has never had before. You put a seed in the ground. I remember, you remember when you used to plant little things, you used to sit there, water the thing, and I used to go digging up every chance I get to see what's happening with it. And then one lady next door said to me, why are you troubling the thing you plant? I said, I'm just checking to see what the stage is. He said, you're just delaying the process. Leave the thing alone and just water the thing and leave it alone. And two days went by, I checked and see nothing there. I'm thinking, this thing a long time. Have you noticed that? Things don't die easily when you're waiting that urgently. It's just true. If you're in a hurry, it's like everything else. You want a cup of tea now, you put the kettle in, you're standing up, this uh, pot never boils when you're looking at it, and you stand up there all the time and take a long time to boil. Eventually it does. You turn your back and it starts boiling. It's almost like when you're looking it wouldn't boil. Grain of sand. Grain of, uh, grain. You put it in the ground. It loses itself and it goes through the process that it has never experienced before. It loses itself. That which is comfortable to it's, it loses that. If you put water in it, what happens? It begins to swell. And the crust begins to crack. Are we with you? Begins to crack. And as it begins to crack, something else comes out of it. And the real fantastic thing I need you to remember, I'm not going to be very short with this piece, is this one. When it dies and it begins to produce something, something strings out of that that is exactly what it is at the core. You can't change the core of the seed that is dying. What you are is what you continue to be. You can graph things. But man, you can't change the nature of the seed that went into the ground. So if you plant a grain of corn, you're not going to expect to have a tree showing mango, julie mangoes at the end of the time you finish with it. It's really futile. We're thinking, why, why would you do that? You're going to have corn. And here's the other thought. So you, you, it changes the comp condition or the condon, the thing of what it is, but here's the best part. But that which comes out of it begins to produce like what is planted. One, two. And it becomes a tree that produces much more than you were when you died. You duplicate who you are when you die. You duplicate who you are when you die. If you never die, you never duplicate. So when we live only always for ourselves, we only live only for ourselves. Nobody is duplicated when we don't die. Did you get that? That's how important dying is. When I die to myself and I begin to live out of that place that I have just died, I now duplicate myself because I become selfless so other people can benefit from my selflessness. So that's why pride is a destructive thing. Being selfish is not a very good thing because selfish people lose people fast. Here's the other part I want to think about is this. Your scope of influence is greater when you die. <laughs> Instead of one grain, you have many grains. So now you can boil a whole pot of corn and put it as a side dish with the rice and the chicken. If you all never died, you'll have one grain of corn that's hard to boil. Are you getting it now? And it's the only thing, you put it in your mouth, you can't chew it properly because you're not sharing anything. In this case, you can have so many corn that you can have corn for now, corn the next day, corn to give to somebody. Out of one has come 
many. That's the principle Jesus is saying here now. I'm about to go through the process of dying, and out of my dying will come many people who don't need to die anymore, but they're going to keep on living and duplicate who I am in their lives. When you and I are selfless, we are duplicating ourselves in the lives of others, and they'll reflect more of us than they've never had dreamt possible. Do you know the scope of influence of one? One can put a thousand to flight, biblically, right? Do you know one person can actually influence more than 1,000 people with that principle? Can you imagine if you and I ever take that seriously, that every single one of us in this room could influence and impact 1,000 people? I was thinking that the other day, thinking, wow, do I know 1,000 people? Yes, I do more, know more, more than 1,000 people. And I keep wondering, I wonder what kind of influence I may have had. What kind of influence you've had with your thousand? How have your selflessness impact them? Or how has your selfishness impact them? Some of them don't want anything to do with us because we're full of ourselves. You just follow yourself. You just follow yourself. You think you're everything on a bag of rice. You're full of yourself. Jesus said, I want to model to you what it means to die to self. In the process of him dying, he opened up the opportunity so everybody can live forever because he died for us. His death means a forever life for me. Get it? He's dying. That one grain of corn means I'm going to have corn for the rest of my life. And that is actually my favorite veggie. I love corn. I will have corn every single day in the week. Give me a chance. I put it on veggie, put it on salad, I put it in rice, I put it by itself. I can just have it all the time. Just, just, just me. My most favorite veggie is corn. Maybe you don't have that as a very, you want to know how come somebody can stand it. But it's okay. We all have different taste buds. Some people like other things. But the point is, when I think of the principle of dying, I think of Christ emptying himself, humbling himself, choosing to die so I can live and my life can become an extended life into eternity. His immediate death meant eternal life for all of us. Did you get that? Immediate death equals eternal life. Say that with me. Immediate death equals eternal life. So if I were to die of myself, there is life eternal coming for other people because I will take the little sheet of paper and I say to them, would you have five minutes for a gospel presentation? Do you know the, reason, you know the things that prevent us from talking to other people? One of the things is we haven't yet died to ourselves because we're very self-conscious. I wonder what they'll think. I wonder how they'll think, how they feel. I don't think I've ever done this. I don't even know what to tell them. Or the people tell you what to tell them. I didn't have that in my thought to tell you this. But I just want you to know that. That's what prevents many of us from dying. We, don't, we think we don't know what to say. Oh, you have a lot of things to say when you get going. They want, you want. The other day I met this person, and she just became a believer in Christ. And man... She was talking nonstop. I was thinking, hallelujah. She said, I'm so excited about God. I'm learning. She, all the wonderful things she's learning about God. You know what happened to many of us when we just became Christians? We couldn't shut up. We kept on going, going. Everybody, I'm a child of the kingdom. But after you get a little bit more seasoned, we call it in Christ, we stop talking. We don't even know if we have a mouth anymore about God. We talk about everything else but God. Strange, eh? Sad. Very sad. Let's go back to Jesus. So I need to start there with you. Let me give you a little transition now that we're going to go with this. Christ knew that when he came to this earth, I want you to look at this text with me now in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to give you two texts in Hebrews, then we go to Ephesians, then we stop. Hebrews is in the New Testament. Before you get to Revelations, you'll find him. And if you find James, you pass him, okay? 
James is on his right hand side. If you turn left, you'll find him. Hebrews chapter 12. Why would Christ come to this earth and die for us? That seed put in the ground and die, put it in the ground is like being buried. Remember that? It's like being buried. Same concept. Um, Paul, the writer of Hebrews, some people believe it's Paul, some people believe it's somebody else, but whoever the writer is, he had just made a list of all the Old Testament people who had actually had faith in God and what had happened. Then he said in verse chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed or surrounded about with so great a cloud of witnesses, the people we talked about, let us lay aside every weight and every sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience um, the race that is set before us. Two, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Listen to this part. Who for the joy that was set before him. Whoa. There's something out there that the father said, I'm going to put here so you can keep this in your mind. That's the finish line. That's what you're walking towards. I like when you have finish lines. I like deadlines for things. Because if you don't give some people deadlines, they don't hurry up and get anything done. That's why when you went to university and college or high school, it said, this paper is due next Friday. He said, why Friday? Can it be two weeks from now? Because you have other papers to do two weeks from then. True. And we don't like doing that, but the deadline is good. It gives us a system to work with. Amen. All right. God has deadlines too. There's a time set for everything. There's a time for everything, Ecclesiastes said, under the sun. Who for the joy that was set before him? What did he do? What does the text say? He endured the cross and despised the shame. One second. The end product, there's a joy experience I'm going to have out here. In the meantime... I'm going to have to go through some stuff. The thing that he was going to experience was a lot more than what he had to go through. The million dollar price out there, when you complete the task, is more joyful than you saving up the money every single month. For 25 years. He said, I don't have to do this again. Yeah, 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 yeah. When you hit that million, you say, praise God, I've arrived at this point. Maybe 25 years is not enough to get it. The end product. For the joy that was set before him. He said, I'm going to go through this one. I'm going I'm to hang in here. It's going to be difficult to be tight, to be tough. They're going to spit in my face. They're going to call me names. They're going to call me a bastard. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. They're going to do all these kind of things to me. But there's something out here that's, that is so big that this is going to seem like chicken feed when I go through this one. What are you going through now? And where is that leading you? Do you know what the outcome of that's going to be? Do you have a clue? This one lady, she, um, she's breaking up with her husband and she decided to have a, a divorce. They had, I think it's two homes, and she purposed in her mind. Well, he had one before she, they got married, and then they got married by another, another home. In her mind, she thought, I'm entitled at least to one of them. But what she did not know is he had not put it in his name, the first one. She did not know that. He thought, just in case, just in case, she hadn't known that. So he's going to get married. He thought, somebody said to him, hey, if even you get married for X amount of time, whatever happened, 50% down the middle, then, so good. But he had heard and he decided he transferred the ownership and the title into the name of somebody else. This one is the family house, no problem. She went to the lawyer and said, listen, as far as I know, I'm entitled to half of both homes. <laughs> and the lawyer said, let's do the investigation. They did that, and he discovered the other home is not in his name. How could it not be in his name? He told me he bought the house. Before I came into his life, 
and she's fighting and fussing over a home that he owned before she came. She was already spending the money that she hadn't yet received. So she ran up some debts. Because after all, you're entitled to both. He can buy you out for this one. <laughs> you're doing good. The lady decided, at the end of this, realized, I have now made all this kind of pile of debt because I, for the joy that was set before me now, for the money that I have coming, I will be very fine. Discovered that when they pay off all the debts in the home, when they sold it, it was not enough for her to pay off the debt she had. For the joy that was set before her, <laughs> she experienced some shame. Because that wasn't worth it. Because she didn't get all the facts straight. Jesus said, I've gotten all the facts. I know how it's going to end. I'm going to inherit a whole pile of people with me. I'm going to introduce them to my father. For that, I will, dis I will put up with this. I can handle this painful, but I will be fine with it. Do you understand that? Do you think you ever make decisions in your life right now based upon what you anticipate down the road? And you think it's going to work really well so you stack up some things over here because one day I'm going to win that million dollars. And I had a dream the other night that I got some numbers somebody say. So they got the numbers and they put it down all the, on this thing. Really there, one guy, $120,000. Where is that? $120,000. $120, he bought the tickets in the States because it was a whole humongous pile of money. Because he had a dream. $120 just went. That was not the joy that was set before him. Let's bring this down to the Ephesians part. Ephesians 7. I'll give you another one. Hold it, keep your finger there, and I want to tie it up with Ephesians chapter 2. In Ephesians 2, let me share it with you because if I start reading it, we're going to be here for the next 25 minutes, and I want to do it in about 10 minutes. We have been studying the book of Ephesians for quite some time, and we've discovered that Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, 15, and 16, and 17, and 18, they have this very important concept. I want to give it to you in a capsule. You've heard a lot of it, and I'm going to go through all that I've said before. Jesus Christ came, and he decided that my coming here, there's one thing I have in my mind, is to create or to make a very independent unit of people that never existed. It's called the church. Prior to that, God the Father and God chose a man, Abraham, and well, all through that program and devised a program where the people we call Jews or Hebrews existed at the people through whom Christ will come. It isn't because they were the most special people on planet Earth and because they were most righteous than everybody else. That was not the reason. In fact, Abraham is from an idolatrous background. They serve idols. It's just the wisdom of God that made him choose Abram. He came down to the place. He was obedient to God. We all know the story of that. And then they came into the wilderness out of, out of Egypt. And they were there for quite some time. And God gave them all kind of laws and regulations. He gave them the Ten Commandments. Their constitution by which this new nation should operate. It involves some laws, some decrees, some ceremonial activities. Some daily practices. Because God wanted them to see that there's something coming in the future that will reflect all the things that you were doing here. Now, then this man named David had a great idea that he's going to build a temple because God, you don't want to be in this, this um, skin thing out in the wilderness to carry you all over the place. Let's make it permanent. So they made a permanent place, but David didn't get to do it. Solomon built the first one. Approximately a thousand years before Christ. Well, that didn't last for quite some time. Why? Because the same people were so rebellious, worship idols, and they were taken into captivity. And these people came in and destroyed that whole nice, wonderful place and took away all the stuff that they put in it. They were away for quite some time in bondage. And it was time to go home because God told them, I'm going to bring you back to the place 
when God moves you out, he has a way of bringing you back sometimes. He said, you left there, it's your place, you got to go back there. So God sent a man named Zerubbabel. They sent a man named Nehemiah. He sent another man named Ezra. Well, there was a wall that was broken down. He said, Nehemiah, your job was to build a wall. Well, there's a temple that needs to be rebuilt. Zerubbabel, you're the temple builder. You go back home and build the temple. Ezra, you're the one to reinstate worship. Are you getting this yet? This is a little Bible history for you now. All that was done, establish it, build this place. It was almost the same size, but not as glamorous and glorious because they didn't have as much gold to do it. Now, that little place had a real problem. During that time, the Gentile people were allowed to be part of the family. They were not hated. But over a long period of time, listen to the saints, over a long period of time, the people of Israel became subjected to, a lot of, to the Gentile nations. The Syrians, the Medo-Persians, the Persians. All of these people overtook them and really squeezed them and ripped them off and got things from them. Used them as slaves from time to time. Inside of the group and the hearts of the people develop resentment with these Gentile people. So now you'll understand. Why is it that the Jews keep not wanting to have anything to do with Gentiles? Because every time they close their eyes and think it was the Gentile people who kept killing them and confiscating their things from them. Now, if you were in the same position, would you wave a flag and say, praise God, come on over to my camp? No. They didn't do that. So that's what they did. So they built that temple. There's a, and after a while, it ran into a problem. So there's this guy named Herod. He decided he wanted to rebuild the temple. 20 years before, 20 or so years before Christ was born, he rebuilt this temple in Jerusalem. So big and nice and wonderful and terrific. He got all the, the priests and everybody involved in building. They refurnished it. They have four different levels, four different stories. And then he decided... Being a Gentile myself, we need to put a court in. So they put in a court of the Gentiles. It had four courts. The most holy in the middle, right in the back, the first one inside. Then there's a little one out here. Then there's another one out here. They had a court for the ladies too. And on the outside, they had a court for the Gentiles. Gentiles had a sign posted, a sign posted in that temple that stated, no Gentile is allowed to cross this place. If you did, you will be killed. Fact. Gentiles were never allowed. Where did they get this resentment from? When you've been beaten down and pushed around and use the slaves and take everything from you and treat you like garbage, after a while, when they get to the point where you've got a little bit of something, you don't want anybody to have any of it. In fact, your God, they don't want your God to become anything to do with you. So when they call you bastards, it is when a Gentile married to another Jew person and they create a son, they call that child a bastard. Now you'll understand why they call Jesus a bastard. He was born out of a wedlock, it's a concept, but it's also an inter interracial thing. Call them bastards. They didn't want to have anything to do with them. When Christ came into this world, that temple was still in operation. The court of the Gentiles. That's where they sold things and buy things right out. It's not a place for exchanging and ripping people off. You guys get out of here. What are you messing up my holy temple doing here? He whipped them and threw the thing over and they got all upset. They were ripping people off. Selling animals that only had one eye and other things with like this. Hold a second now. You're giving them the wrong kind of stuff for the worst kind of money and you're thinking that it is okay. He said, it is my father's house. Don't do that. Get out of here. He wanted to purify the place, bring it back into order and they hated his gods. In fact, the Romans gave the Jews an opportunity to kill the people themselves. That's how bad it was. 
Because he wanted, the, 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 the emperor wanted to become friends with them. Get it? So we give them some benefits. Christ then came and said, you know, in order for a Gentile to become a believer, he has to become a proselyte. He has to be converted. And he has to do all the rituals and regulars and everything else that you guys do, including circumcision. You have to do all these things to be accepted in this group. Christ said, you know, it's not a matter of the rules and the regulations anymore. I have come to eliminate that. I have come so everybody can have free access into the kingdom of God. That's why he came. And listen to the part. That is really fantastic. So when Jesus Christ was crucified, at midday, the Bible said, in the book of Matthew, I think it's in Matthew chapter 25, whatever it is there, 27, 28, 27. In Matthew 27, the Bible said that at midday, the whole thing became dark. From midday to 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, approximately time, the, oh, quick, everything started happening. And the earth begins to quake. There were movements down below. Movements down below. Are you hearing me now? Yeah. Up begin the quick. And in the temple that day, oh, you're going to love this sight. I would have loved to see that happening. The priests who were functioning in the, in the temple that day would have seen the darkness outside, would have felt the earth shake. And suddenly, in the most holy place, there's the holy place, and behind there, there's the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant is, where only once a year the priest was allowed to go inside there. Now they are looking for the first time, never repeated, ever happened before, the veil that separated the innermost court from the outer court, <laughs> ripped down from the top to the bottom. Can you imagine what scene that was for these guys? I think they would have ran out. They've never seen it before. Did you understand what I just said there to you? You may think I'm just dramatizing this, but that's what happened in the book. It ripped from the top to the bottom when he said it is finished and gave up the ghost it was ripped in twain thus making it an access route for everybody anybody Jews Gentiles and to come into the presence of God now what he's trying to say to them don't hold them according to all these rules and regulations because nobody was able to keep them nobody I've just give you free access so all this division between the Gentiles and Jews, what are you carrying on with? He said, I am not here to make the Jews Gentiles or the Gentiles Jews. I am here to take the Jew and the Gentile and put them all together and call them one man. A single different humanity that the world has never had called the church. Now we are that. And then the Bible said, and then the Father, then Jesus Christ decided, he's going to now give us, listen to the word, Access to the Father. Hmm. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. I'm giving you access to the Father through the Spirit. Explain that and then close. The Holy Spirit came and rejuvenated us and gave us a new birth. Praise God for that. He is the one who in, 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 in implanted in our spirit man the life of God. And we became born again believers Unto Jesus Christ through his blood. I didn't tell you much about the blood. If I had even gone there, there would have been another half an hour. But we're going to leave that for another time. So Jesus Christ came. So the Holy Spirit came and infused us with the life of Christ. When he rose from the dead, we all know that the dead people came out of the grave and they, all the stuff that happened with that. All right? They got the new body and everything else. Jesus came. This is a part. And then he now gave us access. Key word is, he introduced us to the Father. In other words, Raymond, this is my Father. When you're introducing people, there's a principle of introduction. You always introduce the lower to the greater. If you have a friend at your school and want to introduce to meet your dad or your mom, you say, Mom, Meet John. 
That's not how it's done. John, I'd like you to meet my mother. You always introduce the lower to the greater. Did you hear that? Proper way of introduction. Raymond is my father. Oh, yes. Dad is Raymond. You reverse it and give it back to him. Yes, acknowledgement, complete the, the cycle. So Jesus introduced us to the Father through the life that the Spirit put inside of us. And then he said, no, you are the new humanity I have on this earth called a church made upon Jews and Gentiles. Level field. Level field. We don't have to go circumcising to prove that we're Jews now. We don't have to keep the Sabbath to prove that we're Jews now. We don't have to offer all these sacrifices anymore to prove that we're Jews now. Do you understand that? We don't have to decide, no, listen, the moral code laws in the Bible is still true. It doesn't matter what it is and who you are. Thou shalt not kill, still mean don't kill. The moral codes of God never change. Wrong is still wrong with God. Sin is still sin. doesn't matter what color, shape, and size it is. Biblical principles that relate to morality has not changed with God. The law didn't give wipe that out. <laughs> Can I say it again? The law did not wipe out the moral laws of God. What they did, he canceled or accomplished that which is these rules and regulations. So when a church gets into a whole pile of rules and regulations, I have issues with them. Well, every first Sunday in the month, you better wear a white hat and wear shoe, white shoes. It's true. A few summers ago, I went, went to Brooklyn, spent a couple of times with my brother down there, and I used to walk in about the place, and I go to church every Sunday when visit a different church. This one Sunday, I went, took the bus, and I went to this church of the pastor who actually passed away since then. So at the place where the bus dropped me off, I crossed the street, and there's this little church, narrow church, a spiritual Baptist church, something like that, but mainly among the Africans. So I walked over, and the bus hadn't come, they dropped me off, and I said, on my way back, I'm going to pause a little bit, because it was church time. So I, I stopped there, the bus stopped right there that I'm taking, one bus came, it left, and I thought, okay, that's fine. So I look in inside. I thought, just open the door, man. I'll go inside now. So <laughs> that's just me. I opened the door, and something looked look wrong, and everybody they had their head tied. It's okay. Everybody dressed in white. Everybody had a bottle of water. Bottle of water. And they were marching around the bottle of water. I'm thinking, what is going on? A bottle of water? Is that holy water? So I thought, and one fellow came up to me and said, hi. I said, hi. I said, I just, just looking. He said, okay. You okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. He stood there because he wasn't sure what to do with me. <laughs> I wasn't sure what to do with me either. I thought, do I go in and sit down? I said, no, I don't do that. I thought, no, no, no let, let me just stay. So anyway, I said, thanks very much. I said, I just knew in the area, I just thought I'd have a look in. He said, yeah, you, anytime you want to come, it's okay. I said, thank you very much. So I stepped back outside. But I became curious of something I saw on the wall. I, I, that's just me, you know. And I just came back and I thought, from outside, I look in the corner and said, what is that thing in the corner there? And I thought, do I open the door again? I said, no, no. <laughs> so I was very, very kind. To be honest, I didn't open it a second time. I really wanted to. But here's the point. When I saw that, I thought, if I were not a Christian, and I was looking for Christ, and I was desirous to become a child of the Most High God, and I walked in the door, I'd be very confused. I'd be asking why everybody had a bottle of water walking around in this place. And they're chanting something. Why does everybody have to wear white? With a head tie, wrapped in a certain way. All of them had to be wrapped in the same way. I'm thinking, really? That's called bondage. It's called religious activities. It's not relationship-based. It's religious Based. I want you to notice the difference. Religious things have rules and regulations and certain things that everybody must conform to. That's what religion does. 
This month is Ramadan for the Muslim people. You all know that. Many people know that. And the people who are taking the whole month off from work. Some people take a whole week off. Because to them, that's very important. Very important. And I respect that with them. They're diligent about what they do. And I praise God for that. So they're celebrating that every single year. Just like we celebrate Easter every single week. Yeah, we call it. The point I am making is, if I have to go through all of these rigmaroles to give my life to Christ and become a child of God, it's called religion. But relationship is based on where I don't have to do a whole lot of things. All I have to do is do what is required of me. Lord, I thank you. Go through the same access route that I have now confessed my sins to you. Acknowledge Christ as my Savior. And you've forgiven me all the sins. I am now saved. Praise God. And I go on living thereafter. That's how simple it is. It's not complex. And maybe because it's so simple. Many people think that's too easy to go to heaven like that. One fellow said to me, you mean that's all I do to become a Christian? Yeah, that's all you do. You mean, you mean just repeat the sinner's prayer or say something, some prayer to God and tell him how sorry I am and ask him to forgive me and so forth. I said, that's all you do. You don't have to jump through a hoop. You don't have to climb over a wall. You don't have to go sprint down the road. I don't have to run behind you to catch you. I said, that's all you do. He said, that's all I do. All you do. He said, that's all I do. I'm ready. I said, give me a hand. I said, pray your prayer. He prayed, God. I just told that after you tell you I'm sorry and forgive me for coming to my life. And I just do that. I say, amen. I said, amen. He said, you're not going to pray? I said, I don't need to pray. I don't have to pray for you. You've already prayed to God. God has already heard your prayer. That was done in a place called Allen Gardens many years ago. Downtown Toronto, one Sunday afternoon. The, hitch, the guy hitchhiked all over my out west to Toronto. Slept on the park bench for months. Later on, came to the church a Sunday night. Stayed with the family. Later on, went to Bible college. Later on, went into an outreach program. Later on, pastored the church. Later on, had children and grew a church. That's all it took, one prayer. Just one little prayer. I mean, that, yeah, that's easy. That's how we did it. We gave our lives to Christ, many of us, maybe 50 times before it became real. But listen, we did it anyway. It is not a religious experience or exercise. It's a relationship building. So Christ said, I want you to know that you are a part of a new humanity, a humanity that never existed before. That's why I died. That's it. Bottom line, I just created a new humanity. And I thought, this is wonderful. We were singing a song today about God and the praise and so forth. And any time we get to sing that song or anything that relates to that, here's how I do it. I envision myself standing or kneeling before the throne of God, bowing down before my God, acknowledging Jesus Christ for having died for me. And if I kept on going there for quite some time, I think I would have started crying because it brings up thankfulness in my heart. Do you understand that? That's what we have as a result of Jesus Christ. Amen, Sister T. You had a question. Your hand went up. My question is in relation to the communion. Why do we have to have communion every first of the month? There's no law, rule, or regulation for that. In fact, some people do it every single Sunday. Creflo Dollar, for example. Every Sunday. They do it. For, the Bible said, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do declare the Lord's death and so forth. As often. So you can do it every Sunday. You can do it every once a year. Some people do it once a year. As often as you do it. There's no rules or regulation for that. We can have it any time. It's just that we have just grew up with the one Sunday in a month. But really, if we find it necessary to change it, we can say, hey guys, you may come once on the community. We haven't come here again. It's not for Sunday. That's how many of us going to respond. It's not for Sunday. Because we all grew up on the first Sunday in the month. Somebody started it. And we just continue it. But it's not mandatory that it has to be done only that day. There are times we've canceled for Sunday because something on, and we do it the following week. Occasionally it has happened over the years. But really and truly, there's no law that says it has to be done that day. Anything else? Any questions otherwise that we just talk about? If they only believe what they, if they believe that they're saved, if you have a dialogue with them, and to, hey, what caused you to believe that? And how did you become saved? I ask the question. How did you become saved anyway? Ask the question. Oh, yeah, I was born in it. One fellow said to me once, I was born a Christian. <laughs> but hand in the pocket, the dude was, I was born a Christian. I said, wow, that's quite a pause. 
I said, you were born a Christian? He said, yeah. My parents are Christian. I grew up in church. I was born one. As far as I knew, I never turned away from it. I just was born. I said, so you still one? He said, I'm still one, absolutely. Oh. I said, if I were to say to you that maybe you're not a Christian, what would you say? He said, Con- convince me. And I said, I'm not going to take off an argument. And he said, I'm not going to argue with this today. I said, I'll give you something to read, and we'll talk about it again. I think we met once after the chatted, but he was still convinced that he's born one. And I really didn't work hard at trying to do anything other than that. Because I learned a statement once, a man convinced against his will will be of his same opinion still. And I thought, no, today wasn't the day for that. All right. Any other questions or comments? We good? All right. I've been enjoying Ephesians, and I hope you're enjoying it as much as I do. I, I really like the book. We, we, I'm hoping, my prayer is that, Lord, may we become a similar church to the Church of Ephesus, please. It would be such a sweet feeling. I have a whole lot of churches that want us to become like, but it's okay. For today is Ephesians. <laughs> Amen. Bow in prayer. Father, thank you for this time we've had together. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your power. Thank you for what you've bestowed upon us and what you've shared to us and in depositing our spirit. Man, we are growing spiritually. We are beginning to become like your son, Jesus. And the desire of my heart is that all of us will find a way to die more up to ourselves and to be, become more alive unto Christ, to become like him. So when people interact with us, they'll be interacting with the Christ who lives within us, who's motivating our responses and our behaviors and our attitudes and our speech and our actions and all the things that go along with us. And may they be able to say, you remind me of somebody I read in the Bible named Jesus. With that, that would be the greatest compliment anybody would ever have for someone who would detect the character of Christ in us. That is my desire for myself. It is my desire for everyone present, for everyone who's a child of God, that people would be able to see something about us that we reflect the Christ who walked on this earth over 2,000 years ago. May Manor Worship Center become the church that Christ is the head of in a way that is so real so tangible, so explosive, so demonstrative that people would be able to say, I was glad I went there. I'm glad I experienced something. And I'm glad that I found the love of God permeating in my life because of my association with those who were at manna. I know it's quite a task. The enemy will try to undermine that. But man, Father, we got, we got the victory. We got the victory over that. According to him, we got that. You've got that. You've got our backs. And we've got each other's backs. Thank you. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. Thank you for taking the time to listen to our message presentation by Pastor Raymond Burnett. If what you have heard has been helpful to you, please tune in again or write us and let us know how this message has ministered to you. Our email address is pastor at mwctoronto.org or call us at 647-340-9252. We would love to hear from you. If you would like to support this teaching ministry, you can send a donation to our mailing address, 170 Oakwood Avenue, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, M6E-2T9. Thank you for listening.